so now we are moving on to identification. Now you can have your students collect bees in the cure, like I mentioned before, or you can do observational. Now this is showing you bees that I have collected from a study. The first thing I wanna point out is there are two different types of boxes that you can use to store your bees. This is what I use for students, and this is a very cheap box. It has styrofoam on the inside, cardboard for the bottom, and the lid. Now the problem with this type of bee box is you will get tiny beetles called dermestids that go in and eat your specimens. So you will want to put these in the freezer or circulate them into the freezer every month or so. This is the box that I normally use. Now these boxes are in about $50, so they're probably not feasible for cures, but they are very good at preventing dermestids from getting into your box. Now the other thing you can do when you use a student box is you can buy strips with chemical on it that deters the beetles. Um, it's a little bit toxic, so it's up to you. Now, what I wanna go over with identification is some of the main characteristics that you can use to group bees. I'm not going to go into the finer points of identification because there are many, many characteristics we look at in a dichotomous key. So let's go over here. Now, one thing I wanna show you, this is a pamphlet that I made for a citizen science project in California. And what I wanna show you is some of the information that you can prepare for your students to help them group bees in the field, especially if they're doing <laughs> observational sampling. So here we have a carpenter bee, and I am showing you a picture of a female and a male. Now under here, is some basic information about carpenter bees. And I wrote down floral host, the plants that we most commonly find carpenter bees foraging on. So this would be a very useful item for identification and you can make it into a PDF so that your students have it on their phone. So I want to show you some of the diversity that you will see, especially with Arizona bees. Keep in mind that we have 1,000, approximately 1,000 bee species in the Sonoran Desert. So this is a variety that I pulled out here to give you an idea of the variation that you'll see. So the first bee that we have here obviously is metallic blue, and you probably have never seen a bee that has this color. These are pretty common bees and they generally come out in the spring. We have certain bee species in the spring, different bee species in the fall. This bee has a very distinct striped abdomen. This bee is called Anthidium and they are fairly common in Arizona. I pulled out this bee because this is the most common bee you will see here. This is a sweat bee. Now that is a general categorization. These bees nest aggregately, so if you pan trap, you may get a lot of these bees in your pan. This bee I pulled out because it's one of our smaller species. Now in Arizona, we have the smallest bee species here, Perdida, and one of the largest being the carpenter bee. And finally, here is what we call our leaf cutter bee. Now let's go over some of the characteristics here that you can use to group bees. This leaf cutter bee, the blue bee on the end, and the one that I have in the microscope here, all have scopy or pollen collecting hairs under their abdomen. That is a very key characteristic to this group. This group is called megachylidae. Now that's a family name, I just call them megachylids. So you can actually make that one of your groups that students put bees into. It's a little harder to see the scopy in the field, but if you look carefully, you should be able to see pollen on it. 
Now, another grouping would be, of course, small bees, and then you could have medium bees being like your honeybee or your anthidium. Other characteristics that I look at is where the bee has their pollen. Now, like I said, the megachylids will have it under the abdomen, but if you take a look at a honeybee, they have almost a blade-like hind leg, and the pollen is formed into a ball, and it is attached to the pollen hairs on the blade-like leg. So if you are ever curious about whether it's a honeybee or a different type of bee, just look at where the pollen is. Honeybees are one of the few bees around here that have the pollen in a ball. Other characteristics you can use to group your bees, of course, would be color. We have black bees, brown bees, metallic bees, bees with striped abdomens, this way, you can get a really broad idea of what type of bees you are seeing in the field. And if students are doing observational uh, sampling, you can also get an idea of relative abundance. Like, are you seeing just a few metallic bees or a lot of metallic bees? Now, with observational sampling and netting, you can always make a floral host association, and that is very valuable information but it also depends on the questions that your students are asking. So that concludes identification of bees. And I want to reiterate that when you look at the types of questions that your students are going to be asking, you will decide on the sampling method. And if it is observational, maybe your students can go out and decide on the groupings that they may use.